2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Father, we come before you and we pray that you would strengthen us now as we open your word, that we would be able to understand these things that are written and it would change how we live. And Lord, that we might know you. You said, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom or the mighty man glory in his strength, but let him that glory, glory in this, that we know and understand you, the Lord. And so I pray that your word would open to every heart that is listening. And Lord, that they would leave with a greater sense of who you are. And Lord, how much you love them. Please bless this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just to keep you from getting too antsy and worried, let's go back to chapter 2, verse 13, familiar ground. We are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved of the Lord. This is mind-blowing, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. And here you are sitting in church. I hope you know the Lord. But he's chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Whereunto he called you, note that, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught, whether by word or our epistle, which are now our New Testament. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which has loved us, with an, loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, may he comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. So now chapter 3, verse 1, we pick up. Finally, brethren, by the way, note for the record, he said finally, and look how many more verses you have. Finally, brethren, pray for us. Paul knew that he needed prayer as much as anyone else. And let me demystify that for you. What, you. what is prayer? Prayer is quite simply talking to God. It is telling God the things going on in your life, the things that are going on in your heart, your world. And the Bible says, look, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with humble request, supplication, pray. Prayer is simply talking to God and bringing before him the things in our lives. Prayer. Praying for others, praying for ourselves, praying for our families. So simple. We make it so complicated, but in, in fact, in short, it is simply talking to the one who created everything and asking for his help. Finally, brethren, pray for us. That the word of the Lord may have free course. The idea is flow freely or be able to freely be you know, disseminated is the idea. Or perhaps another way to look at it, that nothing would keep it from being able to spread and spread out to those who are listening. The word of the Lord might have free course. Now, why is that important? Glad you asked. Romans chapter 10, left turn. Book of Romans chapter 10. Why is it important for the word of the Lord to be able to freely be proclaimed and to have free course? Chapter 10 of Romans, if you're just tuning in, in a sense, to the book, he's been teaching the church at Rome many things. But in chapter 9, 10, and 11, he deals specifically with Israel and with the Jews. And the reason why is because the Emperor Claudius had thrown the Jews out of Rome at that time. And so a wave of anti-Semitism is rising. And so Paul wanted to make sure the church at Rome would not get infected by that anti-Semitical wave. And so he began to lay out to him what is going on with Israel at the present. What's happening with them? What is God going to do with them in the future? We can't go through all that. But we land in the middle of it in chapter 10, verse 1. And he said, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer, again, talking to God for Israel, is that they might be saved, the Jews. For I bear them, the Jews, record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, again, these Jews, fellow Jews, being ignorant of God's righteousness. Wait a minute. There's a righteousness that comes from God. That's important. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, are going about to establish their own righteousness by trying to keep the law, and have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. There it is again. There is a righteousness that we can get from God. For Christ, or the Messiah, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. Interesting. So we can receive a righteousness from God... And it's found through the Messiah. And we have to believe. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law. That the man which doeth those things, trying to keep the law, shall live by them. In fact, he told us elsewhere in Romans, if you break just one command of the law, you're guilty of what? The whole thing. The Bible says you shall not lie. How many of you have ever told a lie? If you don't raise your hand, you just lied. 
And if we tell lies, that would make us liars. The Bible says you shouldn't steal. How many of you have ever stolen something? Yeah, if you don't raise your hand, you're lying now, and you've stolen from your grandma's candy dish or whatever. That would make us thieves. So within, what, five minutes of the sermon, you're all liars and thieves. Sounds like you need a savior. The man that does these things shall live by them. We've all failed. But the righteousness which is of faith, and by the way, that righteousness of faith which comes from God, speaks on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring the Messiah down from above, or Christ, or who shall descend into the deep? Oh, time out. Do you guys remember two weeks ago, Harry talked for me while I was away? And you remember he was in Ephesians there, and he was talking about he who ascended first descended, and he gave you a couple answers, and he threw that hot potato to me and said, well, when Swanson gets back, he'll solve it for you. Do you remember that? How many, I remember him saying that. Like, wow. Well, here's the answer. It was, again, uh, now he that ascended, what is it but that he also descended, Jesus, into the lower parts of the earth. And Harry mentioned there were two theories. One, that Jesus' coming to the earth was that descending. Two, that Jesus actually descended into the heart of the earth, and there made a proclamation. And he was arguing, well, Chris will tell you which one. Well, I won't tell you which one. I'll let Romans tell you which one. Look at what it says. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Verse 7. Or who shall descend into the abusos? That word is the pit. What pit? Pit in the heart of the earth. Now, if you're here and you've received Jesus Christ as your Savior by faith, you have received the righteousness of God. And for those who believe upon Jesus by faith, when you die and you're absent from the body, where do you go? Present with the Lord. Good, you guys have read that scripture too. But if you have not received Jesus Christ by faith, therefore you do not have the righteousness of God that comes by faith, and you are approaching God based on your so-called righteousness, where do you go? Sheol, or this place known as also the Abusos, this part of it. You go to a place where you are with the other dead who have died in unbelief of God and are awaiting for the final day of judgment before a holy God. And if you're taking that in and really considering it, the next thing should be, oh God. So he descended. Who shall descend into the pit? That is to bring Christ up again from the dead. He descended, it tells us in 1 Peter 3, and made a proclamation there, most likely of his victory over death. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, it's that close, and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thine, where? Your heart. Hey, do you remember the road to Emmaus? He said, O oh, fools and slow of heart. You see... Well, for example, Super Bowl, right? They get, they get down to the, you know, the, the goal line, and they get shut down. And that's it. And they lose. And people are like, man, they, was so, they were so close. They almost went, mm, you know, right? And they lost. Well, there's another battle, and that is between your head and your heart. And that distance is about 18 inches. It's so close. But faith and salvation come from the heart. And that's part of the problem, see? There are many people who know intellectually that Jesus of Nazareth existed. They know that they, inter yeah, I know he was a historical person, and I've heard there were things about him and, and all that. So they, they will essentially agree to that he existed as a person in history. They know something with their head, but that's not where we get saved from. The Bible repeatedly speaks to us. It's when we believe upon God from our heart. And maybe you're here this day going, well, you know, okay, here it is, Easter, and I came with the family to make nice, and I hope I get brunch out of this and all that, and how long is this guy going to go, and, and all that. But meanwhile, your heart's going, shh, listen, listen. And there's this battle. Don't want to listen. I don't want to change my life. Yes, you do. I'm tired of all the garbage you keep handing me. Listen. Don't want to listen. And that's the battle. That close between your head and your heart. It's so near. It's even in your mouth, the word of faith which we preach, that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, that you've made him your Lord, you hand him the keys and let him drive. And you shall believe in thine heart that God raised him from the dead. Look at this. You will be saved. Well, that's easy. Yeah. That's why it's called good news. But he goes on. 
For with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. Wow. So you believe upon Jesus from your heart, confessing him with your mouth. You receive what he started in this chapter, the righteousness that comes from God. And that righteousness that comes from God now puts you in a right relationship with God so you can one day be in the presence of God. Nice. So with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. You know, that's so easy in verse 10 here. Romans 10.10. 10. You can get that at home again. 10.10. 10, that's easy. It's, it's so easy that no one can be left out if they're willing to open their heart. It excludes no one. But they have to be willing to ask. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on Jesus, on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek or the non-Jews. For the same Lord is Lord over all. He is rich unto all that call upon him. And in case we missed it the first time, he says it again. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yeah, but what does this have to do with the word of God having free course? Glad you asked. Next verse. How then shall they call on Jesus in whom they've not believed? How shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preacher? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. They've not all been willing to believe and receive him. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? So then, faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. So why is it important for the word of God to be freely able to get out? Because it's when you hear the word of God and understand there is a God who loves you, who sent his son. In fact, let me do it this way. You guys, you've heard this before. God so loved the, that he gave his only begotten, that whomsoever believeth on him would not perish, but have, everlast, have everlasting life or eternal life. And he goes on, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That would make him a gift which you must receive. And you must receive it by faith in your heart and confess him with your mouth. God so loved the world that he sent not, he sent, sorry, let's try it again. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whomsoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. You've now got the righteousness of God. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And by the way, the law, prophets, and psalms have 330 plus prophecies of what Messiah should do. And there's only one person in human history who's done them, and his name is Jesus of Nazareth. There's only one who could be the Messiah. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. So faith comes by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. That here we are, 1,000, we think, 985 years later, the tomb is empty, Jesus is risen, and to all who will make room in their hearts and bring him in, he will not only forgive you your sins, he will fill you with the Holy Spirit, he will change you from the inside out, and you will never be the same. You will finally begin to understand, why are you here? You'll learn now, where are you from? You'll know why you're here, and thank God, you'll finally know where you're going. Those are the things given to us in Jesus. But back to our chapter. We've got to get somewhere through our chapter. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course, be able to go out freely, and be glorified even as it is with you. How is the word of God glorified with them? Well, they heard it, they believed it, and their lives began to change. And people notice that. They say, you know, you're not cursing like you used to curse. You know, you're not throwing fits all the time like you used to throw fits. You know, you're <clears throat> happy. What happened to you? I received Jesus. He moved into my heart. Everything changed. That's how the word of God is glorified in you. He goes on and he says, pray for us also, verse 2, that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Wow, 
They had them in their generation too. For all men have not faith. That's tragic. But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and who shall keep you from evil. And he will keep us from the ultimate evil. What Satan has done to this world, making him think they've came from non-living material, making him think there is no day of judgment, there is no God, there is no abundant life, there is no hope. And those who want to follow the kingdom of darkness will reap with him God's judgment. Thank God he'll establish us and keep us from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching or concerning you that you both do and will do those things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God. And that's where you'll find love in God. And into the patient waiting for Christ, who he had taught them will appear suddenly for his church, whom he will call out and bring into his father's house. Good stuff. But we're out of time. So let's stand and let's pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this Resurrection Sunday. That tomb is still empty. It is the ultimate gift receipt that the payment has been made. Our sins have been washed away by the blood of Christ. And that for anyone who will make room in their heart for you, ask your forgiveness and confess you as their Lord and their Savior, right where they stand this morning or where they are at home listening. You will come in. Prayer is simply talking to God. Prayer is simply being honest with God, the things you've done to offend a holy God. We learned this morning we've all lied and stolen. Those are enough right there. But the older we get, the more we know just how many things we have truly done that would offend a holy God. And so, Lord, I ask for anyone here, their hearts are crying out, this is your chance. Don't leave here without opening. Call upon the Lord. I pray for those who are having that battle right now, that the Spirit of God would so minister to them that right where they stand, today would be the day they tell you from their heart they believe. They believe you paid for them. They believe you rose again, and they want that eternal life you promised as a gift. You do that between you and God right now where you stand. He will come into your heart and change you. Lord, I do pray that you would bless your people as they go. I pray you'd strengthen us. And Lord, you'd move in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Happy Easter.